Let's get started. Uh, so, last lecture we talked about uh, how to debug your machine learning algorithms and how to figure out what the problems are. Um, another uh, important tool uh, in that domain is actually visualization, trying to understand uh, why and how your network is responding the way it does. Um, and so that means so far, we've basically seen these deep neural networks as black boxes. You give it a bunch of examples, and then you measure its performance, and it somehow starts recognizing cats and dogs. But that still doesn't tell us um, how it's doing it, you know, what kind of fi filters, what kind of features it's using to accomplish uh, its task. Um, and when things are working, that's fine. But when things aren't working, then um, we may actually want to go uh, look into the details of the network in a bit more detail. Um, so, you know, one, one recent anecdote is that Ozan and I are trying to create a new type of neural module that will um, recognize certain features in an image and also be able to shift to some relative positions of previous um, attention maps. And uh, in the first experiment, Sozan was having a hard time training this thing. It wasn't converging the way we wanted to converge. And you know, what do you do? You know, you invent a new architecture. You try to train it. You use Adam. You use SGD. It's not going the way you want it. Um, either there is something wrong with your model, and it can't represent the function you're trying to represent. But let's say that's not it. Let's say you can actually de hand design a particular. Um, model that that will accomplish the task uh, that you set out for. So then the problem is with optimization, and then you need to look at the activations, the gradients. Um, you need to see if the gradients are falling to zero. Is that why this thing is not converging, or are they wildly swinging around? So looking inside the network um, is what we're uh, going to focus on today. Um, and when I say looking inside the network. Uh, let's remember that there is two types of things in the network, uh, activations and weights. So normally the way I draw it is basically, um, you know, here's our input x1, right? So, and then we have some weight matrix or, or filter, convolutional filter, let's call it w1. There is some operation that takes place and we get some sort of x2. If this is a convolutional network, x2 is a tensor. Right, so a single instance basically generates a three-dimensional um, tensor with ch some channel depth, uh, and then we, pro you know, operate again with W two. We get X three, three, etc. So these are the things on the left are the weights. The things on the right are the activations. Um, so weights are the things that are fixed, uh, unless we're training. Um, and th that basically represent the strengths of the connections of uh, neurons in the neural uh, uh, picture of things. And activations are the things that change every time you feed it a new image or a new instance. <coughs> and both might be important. Visualizing both, visualizing what's going on in both sides might be important, number one. And number two, uh, gradients of both things might be important. The gradients of the weight will tell you, you know, how your optimization is going. Uh, gradients of the activations, which we haven't uh, done so far, but it's very easy to do in Knet, um, might tell you what sort of, uh, what parts of the input is the output, for example, is most sensitive to. Okay, so, So before we get started, um, there's a bunch of uh, readings that um, I put on. There's some videos, papers, uh, slides, etc. We're going to go over some of the um, examples. It was in the Stanford class, some uh, that uh, I just programmed in our little notebooks. Um, 
the project baseline model is due tomorrow. Anybody having a hard time completing this baseline model? Anybody have any questions how to do the baseline model? So this is maybe um, you know an important milestone that you shouldn't uh, be late for because the rest of the project is going to depend on having a complete end-to-end -end implementation of something that you can improve on. So if you don't have that to start with, then uh, your project might be delayed. And there is a midterm next week, and you guys can use cheat sheets, etc. Any questions before I get started? Okay. Um, I'm going to start with RNNs. So here's a paper uh, we wrote a couple of years ago, um, trying to figure out what's going on inside RNNs. Uh, and uh, RNN visualization is an understudied uh, area. It's, it's harder to understand what's going on. It's, it's, it's harder to visualize what's going on inside an RNN. Uh, so most of the examples today will be about convolutional networks. But I'll start with this one, just to give you an idea what you can do with RNNs. The particular model we're interested in here is a sequence to sequence model. So let's remember what a sequence to sequence RNN does. Um, so you have an input sequence ABC that basically gets processed by an RNN called the encoder. The encoder finally produces a, uh, a hidden vector that we pass uh, as the initial hidden state of a different RNN called the decoder. And the decoder starts generating um, some tokens, some words, uh, until we get the end of sentence token, at which point we stop. So one of the things we noticed is uh, um, in statistical machine translation, which used to be the state of the art method before uh, neural networks got in the picture, uh, it was very difficult to calibrate the lengths of sentences. So sometimes you started translating a sentence that was 60 words long, and then after 10 words the thing stopped. And there was no, um, it wasn't easy to basically um, keep, the, keep a reasonable length. And uh, one thing we noticed with neural machine translation systems was that they did all sorts of other mistakes, but they almost never uh, failed to represent uh, output a sentence of the right length. So this paper was an attempt to try to understand how that's happening. So what we did is, um, we start with a toy problem. So here's our toy problem. Uh, our toy problem consists of a language with two words, A and B. And we generate random sequences of these two tokens. Um, and the task is very simple. The task is basically to copy this thing and output the exact same sequence. OK? It's a copying sequence to sequence RNN. So the encoder should basically read an AB sequence that's up to length 9, I think, in this experiment, and uh, re somehow represent it within its final hidden state. In this experiment, the final hidden state had four uh, numbers. So we, we translate a sequence of nine, up to nine A's and B's into four numbers. And the decoder should take these four numbers and regenerate the same sequence. That's the problem, right? Now, we don't know how it's going to encode this thing. We don't know what these four numbers are going to represent. But after we train it, and after it starts successfully copying these sequences, we can open the network and see what it's actually doing. Question? By encoder, do you mean the weights of the hidden layer? By encoder, I mean a complete LSTM. So there is a, one LSTM with its own weights called the encoder, another LSTM with different weights called the decoder. Uh, they share the hidden state. The encoder's last hidden state becomes the decoder's first hidden state. Uh, the other difference is on the encoder side, I don't look at the outputs. The encoder outputs don't affect my loss, so they're ignored. Whereas on the decoder side, the outputs are actually the output tokens that I'm predicting. Okay, any other questions about the setup? OK, so here's, uh, since we have a very simple problem, just A's and B's, and we have only four um, weights, we can actually uh, 
plot uh, our examples in this weight space. So what kind of sequence is leading up to what kind of hidden weights? Okay. So in this first plot, the x-axis is the first hidden weight, the y-axis is the second hidden weight, and the individual points basically represent uh, which sequence gets represented with which first two numbers. Okay? And the second graph is for numbers three and four. So looking at the first graph, and let's look at just the x-axis, the x uh, dimension, which is the first hidden state. What do you think this number has learned to represent? Yeah, it seems like it's actually counting the length uh, pretty good, right? So if it's uh, around uh, minus 1 here, we have a length of 1, minus 2, we have a length of 2, etc. So it's minus the length, almost perfectly. Uh, what do you think the y-axis is trying to represent? Any ideas? Huh? A or B? Like number of Bs? Right, so if you notice, you know, the lower examples have more A's and the upper examples have more B's. And if you actually look at the numbers carefully, it represents something like number of B's minus number of A's. How many more B's are there um, in this sequence? Notice that we didn't actually tell the network to learn any of this stuff. We just told it to be able to copy a sequence. Um, and it learned to encode these things itself. Yeah? When I look at this graph, I actually see that the numbers between minus 1 or 0 to minus 10, and if you think about the kind of floating numbers here, mm -hmm. it can uh, memorize all the things in this ninth uh, element sequence. It can place every one of them easy, like learning uh, something for another sequence. Yeah, it can generalize to copy any sequence. Now, if you represent, if you're thinking about the capacity of the hidden state to represent sequences, mm -hmm. remember that the hidden state, let's say we're using 32-bit floating point numbers, so the hidden state actually has four times 32, 128 bits, right? Mm -hmm. And with 128 bits, you know, how many sequences can you represent? I mean, if you were writing this as a program, you would be able to represent a lot of bits. But we're not writing a program. This guy is trying to learn uh, how to represent this thing by uh, putting it into what it thinks are continuous numbers, right? So, um, so in that sense, for example, I was first shocked uh, to find out that in real machine translation, let's say you're trying to translate English to French, a thousand hidden units is enough, you know, to translate up to 40 word sentences. That that seemed amazing to me. But if you think about it, a thousand floating point numbers, uh, the number of bits in the thousand po floating point numbers is, you know, 4,000 bytes, right? And 4,000 bytes, if you were to represent something in ASCII, would be more than enough to, you know, write a, uh, four pages. Uh, but if you do some experiments and try to reduce the hidden unit size, uh, somewhere below 700 hidden units, it actually starts not being able to do its job. So the, the bit capacity and the number of floating point numbers you need to successfully learn something are different from each other. Um, any guesses as to hidden, um, hidden number three? We looked at these things for a very long time before we were able to... Well, no, not the first one. The first one was very obvious. The second one was also not too difficult. Um, the third one seemed to encode the um, initial prefix. And if it starts with A's, um, whether or not it starts with an A, or if it starts with a B, whether or not it starts with one of one B or more Bs, you can read the paper to see. And finally, for the fourth hidden unit, we, we had no idea what it was doing. Okay, but I'm sure it's you know doing something useful. Uh, it just takes a bit more trial to understand. And here's another plot 
well, three plots, I should say. So the first plot basically uh, represents how the encoder hidden states evolve on a trained network for this sequence that it's trying to memorize, B, 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 A, B, A. Okay? So it's seeing these, uh, you know, start of sentence B, 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 A, B, A, and then we plot the actual numbers uh, that appear in these hidden states at every time step. And you can see, for example, the, that the hidden unit number one actually it is just counted. Okay? It's going, you know, um, at, at first it's uh, about zero, and it goes minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. It's just counting the number of words. And if you look at the decoder, remember the last hidden state of the encoder gets passed to the decoder, it counts backwards. Uh, minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus four. So it's basically able to um, stop at the right point in time. Um, so um, that's our first example of visualization. After this, uh, Kevin Knight and his students did a lot more looking at you know, how, I don't know, now phrases and verb phrases are represented and how other things about language are you know, encoded in these numbers. Uh, but it's still, a, I think, an underexplored um, area. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yes, good question. Uh, the people who are working with these actually uh, things, and they are looking at the graphs, and they try to come up with an idea. Right. Do they actually apply uh, some dimensions reduction just for visualization? Um, in this case, we didn't have to because we we basically reduced the number of hidden units to four, mm -hmm. so that we could see it with our own eyes. But yes, dimensionality reduction is one of the things that I'm going to show you today on the CNN visualization. Okay. Uh, Just examples. visualization. Well, you can, you can do whatever you want. You're a researcher, you have KNET, you know, you can basically write any program you want, look at any part of the network or gradient that you want, um, and we'll see a bunch of examples. Okay, so uh, next, uh, let's look at a visual example. Um, so, in our MNIST examples, uh, we first started with a linear model. So, a linear model basically takes an image as a 784 dimensional vector in MNIST and then multiplies it with a weight matrix that has 784 by 10, which gives us the scores, the 10 different scores for the classes. And then we basically pick the class with the highest score. Okay? So what's happening here is that each row of that weight matrix becomes something we take a dot product with the input, and that dot product basically measures how close the angle is between the two vectors, right? And the highest one wins. So we can actually look at each row of W as a potential image. If we actually you know, shift and scale it into the right region, we can basically look at it like an image. Because what, what it's doing is it's multiplying, dot producting uh, its numbers with the pixels in the image. And the output determines how close we are. So if that's one way to interpret the rows of W as images, uh, let's try to visualize those. So here's our linear notebook. So at the end of this notebook, I added this visualization thing. But remember, it's basically taking W1 times you know, two-dimensional x and plus W2. And this W1 is uh, 10 by 8, 784. We did all this, drew the graphs, etc. So here's here's a little thing I, I wrote. Um, it's maybe more complicated than necessary, but I'm taking the weights W and reshaping them because it's 10 by 784. So I uh, take the transpose, make it 784 by 10, and then I reshape it so that it's 28 by 28 by 1 by 10. So it, it's as if there are 10 images now. 
in, in the third line, W1. Uh, looks like it's a batch of 10 images. And then in W2, I do some translation and clamping. I looked at the histogram of the numbers. The histogram of the numbers were ranging from like one, minus one point something to one point something. I mean, this is a weight matrix, it's not an image, so it's not restricted to be, you know, in, within anything. Um, but to, to make it an image, I need to turn every value inside to some number between 0 and 1 to correspond with the grayscale. Okay? So I just shifted and clamped it. And what I'm going to do here is, uh, throughout the 100 epochs that we trained this thing, I'm going to plot the weights, um, these weights as images. Okay, ready? So here white means positive numbers, black means negative numbers. The medium gray surrounding the numbers is basically zero weights. And you see the, the 10 rows of the weight matrix displayed here side by side. So not surprisingly, this is the row of weights that corresponds to number one. This is the row of weights that corresponds to number two, etc. Okay. So basically, you can think of what this thing is doing is it's taking this image and it's taking a dot product of that uh, with the actual image you give it. And the result determines the score for that particular digit. Okay. Any questions? So this is the first visualization uh, technique uh, for images. Just look at the weights. Okay. So, um, let's shut this down. I tried doing the same thing with uh, the MLP. So, what was the MLP like? Um, in MLP, you start again with 784, it's MLP. And there's a hidden layer. with 256 hidden units. And then you take the output of that and then multiply it with something that's 10 by 256. And that gives you the 10 scores, right? So this is you know x1, the input. This is x2. And finally, this is y, the scores. Now these x2 neurons, if you will, each basically is the result of some dot product of one row of this weight matrix with the actual input. So again, I can look at the rows of this matrix as individual images. I can uh, transpose and uh, reshape them and display them like images. And if I do, I get this. Okay, here is the 256 rows of the um, uh, of the MLP. I mean, uh, in, in each one, the, again, the black, the darker colors represent negative numbers, the lighter colors represent positive numbers, the background gray represents zero, and each one looks like um, maybe a piece of a number. I mean, this, this looks like maybe a, you know, the curve of a two. I don't know, this one might be useful for an eight. Etc. So each of them look like they're capturing some some uh, motif, but it's harder to interpret than the one with the linear case. Um, two fifty six. Um, the resizing of two fifty six was here. So um, I have a weight matrix that is. 256 by 784. I transpose it, so that now makes it uh, like a batch of 256 images that are each 784 in length. And then I finally reshape it to 28 by 28 by 1 by 256 to display them as images. Now all the code is there. I look at the histogram, and then based on the histogram, I shift it to make it between 0 and 1. And that's how I display it. 
Any other questions? So since in Knet, basically, there is no hidden modules and all the operations are just regular array operations, you can look at any weight, you can look at any activation, and you can look at any of their gradients um, very easily and turn them into images, look at what they look like. That, you know, may not always be useful, but it's possible. Um, so what else can we do? Uh, let's look at what else can we do. So here's a list, a little menu of things that people have tried. Um, this is a, this has been an ongoing, uh, you know, field of study, how to do neurosurgery and look into the brains of these things and try to understand why they're doing what they're doing. So briefly, we're going to see. Um, we saw, you know, the our encounter idea, looking into the weights of the CNN. Um, we can look at, for example, if we have an ImageNet model, we can look at which images actually uh, are put closer in the feature space. So if you use a model like VGG, it maps every image into a 496 dimensional vector. That's you know, one of the layers, higher layers. And you can run uh, nearest neighbor algorithms or dimensionality reduction algorithms based on those um, high-level features and see which images it thinks are close by. Now, if you did that at a pixel level, then images with similar brightness and similar color and similar patterns would appear side by side. But it turns out if you do it at a much higher level, we'll get a lot more semantically uh, similar images I'll show you. Um, we can we talked about visualizing weights. We can also visualize activations. So these are the X's instead of the W's. Uh, and then at some point, these things become not very interpretable. Um, so we want to know, we want to ask questions about what certain neurons inside the network are doing. What are they reacting to? So that we can basically uh, analyze by, uh, for example, during testing, we pass a million images through the network, and we look at a particular layer and channel, and we ask, okay, which images actually activated this layer and this channel the most okay, in my data set? And depending on the per visual field that this channel and this layer sees, you know, what are the actual patches that it was very excited about? And I can display those patches and see if this, uh, what kind of visual feature this thing actually will represent. Uh, the occlusion experiments uh, are a smart way of uh, trying to figure out what parts of the image are important. Here, let's say you have a cat that you recognize um, and with great confidence. Your network is sure that this is a cat. You get a big red or gray uh, square and cover part of the image. And then ask again, how sure are you that this is a cat? Okay, what's the probability of the cat? And then you basically shift this gray blob around the image every time asking your network, you know, are you sure this is a cat? And that gives you basically which parts of the image were most important in deciding that it was a cat. For example, if you cover the face of the cat, the confidence falls down sharply. And now you know that it's not some, you know, random background that it's picking up on. It's actually looking at the face of the cat uh, to make this decision. Now, that may not always be true. For example, I forgot who I heard this from, but um, one of the you know, very good trusted networks was recognizing wolves by the background because all of the wolf examples in ImageNet were always in snowy conditions. So whenever it sees some snowy things in the background, it thinks this is a wolf, right? So that, that kind of mistake would be captured by an occlusion experiment like that. Um, finally, we can actually uh, look at the gradients. Gradients are a great tool to see what parts of the network affect what parts of the network. For example, uh, we can pick a neuron in the middle of the network and calculate the gradient of its output with respect to the input image, with respect to the pixels. What does that tell us? Which pixel 
when changed, when jiggled, actually affects this neuron the most. So we call these things saliency maps, and we can take an image and see what parts of this image actually affect a particular neuron, either a um, final layer neuron which decides on the class, or one of the intermediate neurons which is basically trying to figure out a feature. And there's a lot of work um, using these gradients to actually generate artificial images. And if you have time, I'll show you some examples of that. Okay? So let's look at the images now. Okay, so what goes on inside the convolutional neural network? So visualizing filters is, is, is something that we did uh, with the linear layer, uh, linear model. If you do the same thing with something like AlexNet or ResNet, uh, then you get uh, these very um, standard looking filters, these uh, uh, light dark, light dark patterns. Yes? Uh, why is it not in color? Uh, because these are like one... Because three channels. Three channels. My input has three channels, right? Okay. So each of my filters has also three channels. So each of my filters is like a color image. Yeah. So, and some of them are actually gray, which means all three channels are changing together. Um, but some of them are actually color sensitive. Okay. So the gray ones are usually edge detectors, and the colored blobs are sensitive to certain color uh, patches. And of course, the you know most amazing thing about these filters is that they they do replicate what we have in our visual cortex uh, very well, even though we didn't program that and we just trained these things, you know, looking at natural images, trying to detect cats and dogs, which you know uh, I find amazing. Now we can you know play this game for all the different layers, but it becomes harder and harder to interpret as do you get deeper into the network, looking at the filters basically doesn't tell you much. Okay? So at this point we need to resort to other uh, methods. So one method is, as I mentioned before, um, typically all these convolutional nets map the whole image to a n-dimensional vector before making the final decision. Before the fully connected layers uh, make a classification decision we basically, the, the last convolutional layer maps the image to a, you know, in FC7, for example, a 4096 dimensional feature vector. Um, and we can look at this feature vector and tell a lot about what this network has learned. So, let's say I take, I took, I take all 1 million ImageNet images and compute the feature vectors for each one using a trained VGG. Um, and then I can do things like nearest neighbors. So um, on the left here, we see nearest neighbors in pixel space, right? Nearest neighbors in pixel space means, you know, the dot product of these images actually gave high numbers. And, you know, when, I, when my, you know, input image is a, I don't know if it's a dog, I guess it's a dog. I sometimes get dogs, but I also sometimes get sailboats and, you know, other wild animals just because the color uh, and the background is similar because I'm just looking at pixel values. Whereas in the middle here, uh, on the left, we pick a test image, and then on the right, uh, we basically plot the nearest neighbors in this feature space, nearest neighbors in this 4096 dimensional feature vector space, and we get things that are a lot more um, semantically relevant. So, in particular, I like this jack o' lantern uh, picture because in each of these images, as you can see, the brightness is very different, the colors are very different, you know, pixel-wise, the, these images are not very close to each other, but obviously, semantically, they are, and so I can say the same thing for the cats, dogs, ships, etc. So, um, you see that at the end of the network, uh, images that are semantically relevant to each other are brought uh, a lot closer than compared to the pure pixel representation. So any questions about how these nearest neighbors are calculated? We'll probably do a lab on 
visualization and you'll, you'll write all this stuff by yourself on KNET. So ask me a question now if you don't know how, how to do this in KNET. Okay? Sure. One question about the distribution of the values for the Was there any particular distribution? Like you said, you looked at them, the histograms. Distribution. Oh, um, the Ws are usually, you know, you know, half of them are positive, half of them are negative. They just look like a no. even regular Gaussian distribution. Yeah. Yeah, you can actually. Um, we can. Back to that, I'll show you the histogram. Um, and then there was the idea of dimensionality reduction. You can also do dimensionality reduction in this 4096 dimensional space and map this high dimensional vector into uh, two dimensions for visualization and see if similar looking images are brought together. And there's visualization tools like T, you know, TSNE, or I don't know how to, TSNE. Um, and when you do that, uh, you basically get these nice grids. Um, let's actually look at the, uh, one of the actual. Okay, so let's see if I can zoom in. Let's see. So in the upper part, you, I see some cars and you know, dolmushus and tractors and machines and stuff. And over here, goes into sale. Over there, I see a lot of keyboards, calculators, you know, typewriters. Um, so, um, I don't know if you see any other. Here's a lot of people, faces, um, going toward animals, I guess dogs, Cows, panda, over here, you know, monkeys, and then the birds and the spiders are on this side. I guess it's like going away from the mammals and bugs. Uh, frogs are over here, etc. So basically, when you visualize this 4096 dimensional space, you see these uh, regions uh, in the 2D you know, lower dimensional representation that are maybe semantically meaningful. Okay. Yeah. What is this the last layer of? So remember, we map each image to a 4096 dimensional vector. Mm -hmm. And then you take your favorite dimensionality reduction algorithm. You can use PCA or TSNE or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then you map it to two dimensions. So these dimensionality reduction mm -hmm. methods usually uh, try to keep uh, things that are closer in the original space, closer in this two-dimensional space. So this tells you what was close to what in this 4096 dimensional space. We can look at the activations as well. Um, this guy Yosinski actually did a nice demonstration of this. Let me see if I can find the video, which is much more uh, interesting. Recent advances in neural networks have enabled computers to better see and understand the world. They can recognize school buses and zebras and can tell the difference between Maltese Terriers and Yorkshire Terriers. We now know what it takes to train these neural networks well, but we don't know so much about how they're actually computing their final answers. We developed this interactive deep visualization toolbox to shine light into these black boxes, showing what happens inside of neural nets. In the top left corner, we show the input to the network, which can be a still image or a video from a webcam. These black squares in the middle show the activations on a single layer of the network, in this case the popular deep neural network called AlexNet running in CAFE. By interacting with the network, we can see what some of the neurons are doing. 
For example, on this first layer, a unit in the center responds strongly to light to dark edges. Its neighbor, one neuron over, responds to edges in the opposite direction, dark to light. Using optimization, we can synthetically produce images that light up each neuron on this layer to see what each neuron is looking for. We can scroll through every layer in the network to see what it does, including convolution, pooling, and normalization layers. We can switch back and forth between showing the actual activations and showing images synthesized to produce high activation. By the time we get to the fifth convolutional layer, the features being computed represent abstract concepts. For example, this neuron seems to respond to faces. We can further investigate this neuron by showing a few different types of information. First, we can artificially create optimized images using new regularization techniques that are described in our paper. These synthetic images show that this neuron fires in response to a face and shoulders. We can also plot the images from the training set that activate this neuron the most, as well as pixels from those images most responsible for the high activations, computed via the deconvolution technique. This feature responds to multiple faces in different locations, and by looking at the decon, we can see that it would respond more strongly if we had even darker eyes and rosier lips. We can also confirm that it cares about the head and shoulders, but ignores the arms and torso. We can even see that it fires to some extent for cat faces. Using backprop or decon, we can see that this unit depends most strongly on a couple units in the previous layer con 4, and on about a dozen or so in con 3. Now let's look at another neuron on this layer. So what's this unit doing? From the top nine images, we might conclude that it fires for different types of clothing. But examining the synthetic images shows that it may be detecting not clothing per se, but wrinkles. In the live plot, we can see that it's activated by my shirt. And smoothing out half of my shirt causes that half of the activations to decrease. Finally, here's another interesting neuron. This one has learned to look for printed text in a variety of sizes, colors, and fonts. This is pretty cool, because we never asked the network to look for wrinkles or text or faces. The only labels we provided were at the very last layer, so the only reason the network learned features like text and faces in the middle was to support final decisions at that last layer. For example, the text detector may provide good evidence that a rectangle is in fact a book seen on edge, and detecting many books next to each other might be a good way of detecting a bookcase, which was one of the categories we trained the net to recognize. In this video, we've shown some of the features of the DeepViz toolbox and a few of the things we've learned by using it. You can download the toolbox in this URL and explore it for yourself. If you'd like to share what you find, you can use the hashtag DeepViz. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to seeing what you discover. I guess some of these things he already showed, but let's actually go deeper and understand exactly um, how to do these things. So, maximally activating patches, what is this? So we, in a deep network, we go to a particular layer, and in that particular convolutional layer, we pick a channel, okay? So what's a channel? A channel is basically a, the output of a filter in the previous layer, right? So what each, each filter, uh, basically uh, adds another channel to the next layer. So we pick a layer and channel and we say, okay, what is this layer and channel representing? What's this filter looking for? And by looking at the whole channel, uh, we basically capture uh, what this filter is looking at any position in the image. Okay, And then uh, we plot the actual visual field uh, that that filter has been applied to whenever the activation is strong uh, in this layer and channel. So when we do that, we, uh, we see the types of patches um, shown on the right. So the top uh, one seems to respond to noses and eyes and you know, these dark rounded uh, things. Um, and you know, some of them seem to uh, respond to text. Some of them seem to respond to faces etc. So this is also a very 
um, not very difficult uh, thing to implement. All you need to do is run the network through a bunch of images, uh, pay attention to when your favorite layer and channel is highly excited. And whenever it's highly excited, basically look at which region of the image it's highly excited about, and then just print that, and uh, you will hopefully get some intuition as to what this filter is calculating. Any questions? Uh, I mentioned occlusion before. Uh, it's a very simple idea. Uh, you take an image like this, and it knows that it's an elephant, and then you take a gray box and you torture the network by occluding different parts of the image. Uh, you move this gray box all over and ask each time, are you sure this is an elephant? Are you sure this is an elephant? And you get uh, maps like this. So these maps basically give you the probability of the right class. So this is the probability of elephant, for example. And here red means low probability and uh, lighter colors yellow and white means higher probability. So, so that means the red positions are the ones where if we put the gray box there, the confidence actually drops significantly. And in this case, the, the red corresponds to the, you know, the face and the ears of the elephant, for example. And uh, we can see that the schooner, the sailboat, um, is recognized not by the background, but by the actual boat and the sails. Um, here's an interesting example, the go-kart. Okay, so the, it's sensitive to this go-kart, but it's also sensitive to this thing in the background, uh, which is interesting because um, the background doesn't necessarily contain any go-karts, but presumably many pictures of the go-kart images actually had some background that was full of trees and such. Okay. Yeah. Uh, on the elephant example, so you said red is for low probability? Red means when I put the occlusion square at that position, the, the probability of elephant fell significantly. So, like eliminating the data from the like table that you put, is it mean like that? Because like we see the face of the elephant on the red dot there. Uh -huh. So that means we can detect when we have the face and not detect otherwise. Is it like that? Um, okay, so these dark colors here correspond to probabilities about 0 0.4, 0 0.3. So we're still giving some probability to this being an elephant, but this probability is decreased quite a bit if we put the uh, gray square right on the face. Okay, so the this grid represents all the different positions that the center of the square was placed on. Okay. So it, it means we don't have the data from that part. Huh? Yeah, you you you, re you replace all those pixels with gray. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so now we looked at the activations, we looked at the actual weights, let's start looking at gradients. And normally we use gradients for optimization. Um, so we ask, okay, what would happen to the loss if I jiggle this weight a little bit, right? So this time I'm going to use gradients uh, to understand how this network works. So I'm going to ask questions like, what would happen to this neuron if I jiggle this pixel a little bit? Okay, so not the gradient of the weight, but the gradient of the input pixels is what I'm interested in. Now, how would you calculate the gradient with respect to the pixels of a trained network in KHAN? Yeah. How does actual how does KNet compute gradients? What do you do to compute gradients between them? Right, so the loss function, and then what do you do with the loss function? Yeah. 
Right. So you, 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 you run grad on it. Grad returns to you another function, which basically computes the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights. Now, what, why does it compute it with respect to the weights? I mean, you, the loss function has lots of inputs. The first argument, right? So you can actually change that, make it the second argument, third argument. Or you can actually change the positions of the arguments if you don't want to use the option. So if I define the loss function instead of w as the first argument, use x as the first argument, then I would get the gradients with respect to x. Okay, finite differences, please. So that's a very bad way to calculate gradients. So this experiment would be very easy to do in Knet if you just replace W and the, uh, uh, transpose W and X in the arguments of the loss function. Okay, so um, let's say your network ne recognizes this thing as a dog uh, and you want the dog probability or dog score output and you're asking the uh, gradient system to give you the pixel gradients uh, of this dog probability and you get this. So these are the pixels that are highly uh, effective in changing the dog probability. As we expect, they basically capture where the dog is. Okay. So um, these are some more examples. And again, these saliency maps can tell you if something is going wrong and the system is actually sensitive to something else in the image that um, you did not expect. Um, but usually it's, it's looking at the, the right thing. You can even try to use this for segmentation. Even though this thing was not um, trained for segmentation, uh, and even though it's not very good at it, but you can still use it by thresholding your saliency map. Um, okay, the network says this is a bird. You say why? It says because of these pixels. And you take just those pixels of the image and it's basically um, automatically segments your image into bird pixels versus background pixels. Okay? Um, again, there is a lot better segmentation algorithm, so this is not for production use, but at least uh, it would tell you if something was wrong and the network was looking at something uh, different. So any questions about the, this gradient method? Or how to implement it? Now this was for the class probabilities. We can apply the same thing to intermediate neurons. Um, you know, instead of picking one of the neurons at the end, which represents a class, we, we pick one of the neurons in the middle, and we calculate gradients based on that. What does that tell us? That tells us, um, you know, what part of the image is, uh, is uh, what, what pixels in the image is most um, effective in changing the value of this neuron. So when we do that, um, there are also some tricks that people use. If you just use raw gradients, you don't get very good results, I guess. So they, um, they, they, they do these different types of gradients. So let's, um, let's uh, see this with an example. So we have ReLU activation function. That means in the forward pass, we take, for example, a patch, three by three patch of pixels and we replace all the negative numbers with zero. That's what ReLU does in the forward pass, right? And in the backward pass, in the back propagation case, if this is um, the gradient of my output with respect to the loss, uh, going back, I would just replace the same numbers with zero because those numbers had no effect going forward. Their gradient should be zero coming back. So that's how the backward pass of ReLU works normally. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, now there's other things, other types of things I can do. So one is called you know, deconvolution. There's different types of deconvolution. But if this is my gradients going backward, I basically apply ReLU again. So I replace each negative number with zero. 
So this is not the real gradient, but it's an operation that you can perform. Or uh, in this paper, they introduced this thing called guided back propagation, which basically says going back, um, do both of these things. So do the back propagation step, leaving only these numbers, and then get rid of all the negative numbers by replacing them with zero. And it turns out this worked uh, well for the uh, for measuring the sensitivity. And here is the types of uh, results they got. Um, on the right are the patches that were maximally effective in exciting neurons. That we've seen that before. And on the left are the actual images we can artificially construct if we turn this fake gradient into an image. Right. So remember, going back, I'm doing this um, fake gradient operation where uh, I only keep the positive gradients going back. So at the end, um, I get some numbers uh, representing pixel gradients. And if I turn those numbers into images, um, I can actually see what this uh, neuron is looking at in the input image, what kind of patterns it's looking at. Any questions? Okay. Um, now, we're talking about generating images. Generating realistic looking images is not easy. Um, usually, you know, when you display these gradients, uh, you, get, you get things that don't look like images. To make them look more like natural images, we use regularizers. So, um, so the idea is uh, not only do this guided back prop thing that calculates gradients and drops the negative gradients, calculates the positive, you know, passes on the positive gradients. Um, what you do is you start with a blank image, maybe a, pic a uh, patch of gray pixels. And then you do gradient ascent on this, just like we do gradient descent on the weight matrix to uh, decrease the loss. Now, what we're doing is we're taking an activation of an intermediate neuron, and I'm going to construct an image that excites this neuron the most. Not one of the images in my training set. I'm going to create an image from scratch. I'm going to make the network imagine something that will excite this neuron the most. And in order to do that, I can start with a random image or some gray blob. And then I can say, OK, what's the gradient of each pixel with respect to this <coughs> neuron's output? And go in that direction. Not the opposite of that direction, like we did in the SGD. But I want to go in the positive direction. That's why we call it gradient ascent. Um, and then slowly, an image will appear in that gray blob. Yeah. Does it converge? Um, We'll see examples. So, uh, are you, you're asking if there is a maximum? That, um, good question. I don't know. But with the regularizer, it probably will converge, right? So that's uh, we basically add another component, uh, maybe an L2 regularization or something, that basically prevent our image from blowing up and looking like not an image. So if we do that. We can construct some artificial images that represent what these neurons get excited about. Again, we initialize with a zero image. We go forward, computing all the current scores for the neurons. Uh, we do backprop to get gradient of the neuron value with respect to image pixels. And we make a small update to the image, changing its pixels, um, also uh, including this regularizer. So these are the types of things we get if you do this. Okay, so uh, these names were probably given by, I don't know if the, these are the actual classes. I think these are the actual classes. Right. So you take VGG, and dumbbell happens to be one of the classes uh, in the ImageNet competition for which this thing was trained for. And you say, OK. You know, here is the dumbbell neuron. What would excite the dumbbell neuron the most? Okay, and you get something like that. You know, looks like a bunch of dumbbells. And what would excite 
the Dalmatian neuron the most. And you get a bunch of black and white uh, blobs. Now these things don't quite look like images, but you can see features. Here's a husky uh, image that was generated. There's a bunch of husky pa pa faces I can see here. Um, so this is one way to generate, um, understand what these uh, neurons actually are excited about. But I find this a bit hard to <coughs> interpret. Um, and if I start with different initializations, I'd probably end up with different patterns. But at least it's giving us an idea about what these neurons get excited about. And it makes good artwork, right? If you wanted to generate some surrealistic art. Um, here's some more uh, washing machine, computer keyboard. Uh, kid fox, I can see some foxes in there. Goose, definitely looks like a goose. Ostrich, yep, I can see some ostrich faces. And limousine, I can see the wheel here. But yeah, it's not uh, that easy to interpret. Now, we can make the we can make these things look more like images by playing with the regularization and the way we generate them. So uh, a couple of tricks to use. Uh, in addition to using the L2 norm, uh, we do Gaussian blurring of the image so that these little you know, patches get smoothed out. We clip pixels with small values. We clip pixels with small gradients uh, to zero. So all of these tricks actually um, increase the naturalness of the image. and we get things that are a bit more recognizable when we do that. So, again, um, I don't know if you can see this, the you know, ground beetle, and the Indian cobra, and the pelican um, starts flamingo looking a lot more recognizable. Okay? Um, now, we use these things on the final class score, but the same trick, as usual, can be used for intermediate neurons as well. So if you are curious about um, a neuron in the intermediate layer, uh, what kind of things would excite it, you can actually do that. And uh, as you go up the layers, you get more and more um, abstract uh, looking categories. Right, so up there, I'm you know I'm seeing some spiders and some dog faces, etc. Whereas down here in layer two, uh, it's a lot. Well, first of all, it's smaller because the receptive field is lower at the lower levels. Each unit actually sees a much smaller portion of the image. As you move up in the convolution, the receptive field of each unit increases, um, and also. In the lower layers, I basically catch these very low-level features like um, you know, creases in clothing, uh, like we saw in the video, or eyes, etc. Whereas in the top level, uh, we see some complete you know, mountains and dogs and spiders and such. Yeah. If you were dealing with text rather than images, would this be useful? So like an OCR system, and if you visualize it, it would basically show you, you know, what, what sort of features it's looking for. I mean, these are all sort of for our benefit to understand what the um, network is doing. For example, like Q&A system, would any visualization help? So vision people have an advantage on this because, you know, uh, vision processing, image processing, and convolutional networks naturally lead to things that look like images. And our eyes are very good at you know perceiving you know patterns in these images. I mean, this thing, you know, I'm looking, I'm seeing dog faces in there, but that's because you know I have a very strong imagination. If you objectively looked at it, that's not a very nice dog face. But you know, we can see patterns um, which tell us what this network is doing. For other types of networks, you know, we did an RNN example in the beginning, 
um, you can't see, you know, you can't get colorful pictures, so you'll have to, you know, find some other ways to understand what's going on, I guess. Um, so, and then there's some more uh, work along the same lines. Um, one thing that people have noticed is um, if you if you ask a ImageNet model um, about what excites the grocery store neurons the most, okay, it turns out that there is different types of grocery store um, images in ImageNet, and some of them are just displaying um, the produce on the shelves. Some of them are displaying people who are doing shopping, or you know, a higher uh, level view of the groceries in, in shelves, etc. So, this grocery store neurons sort of uh, responding to these things. Uh, the distribution of images that it responds to does not look like a unimodal distribution. It doesn't look like they're all in the same. Um, they all come from the same category. It looks more like a multimodal distribution, right? So, grocery store neuron probably responds to either, you know, a bunch of fruit, or a bunch of people, you know, shopping, or you know, a bunch of baskets uh, with you know round-looking things, right? So the, the, each these three things are internal to network. Probably three different categories it tunes itself to, and the grocery store neuron basically um, outputs true if either of these things are true. So by taking advantage of this, they were able to get um, better visualizations. So these are images that are generated from the grocery store neuron. So in the, to in the top part, we see ones um, that basically look more like um, collections of fruits. In the bottom part, we see more sort of store um, scenes. And, uh, and people have not stopped uh, trying to generate more and more realistic images. So this is, uh, um, I don't know the details of this work, but um, I think that the trick is basically to, instead of using gradients all the way back, um, is this the same work? No, this is the same work um, that uses this multimodal assumption to get more realistic looking images. Um, and this work, which looks amazing in terms of the quality of the images it's generating, uh, uses a trick of um, Instead of optimizing the pixels, you know, maximizing the pixels, it actually maximizes some intermediate layer like FC6. You know, we saw that 4096 dimensional vector before. It basically asks, okay, what would be the, uh, the what would be the 4096 dimensional hidden vector that would excite the lipstick uh, neuron the most? Okay, so we basically find the vector in that hidden space. That's the prototypical lipstick. And then from that vector, going back to the pixels, they use something more mechanical, uh, like deconvolution, instead of uh, using uh, gradients, I think, which basically gives you a lot, um, a lot better quality images. OK. So I think this is a great area. I was a grad student. you know. I totally waste a lot of time with these, uh, generating these pictures. Uh, they're both scientifically fun, and then you can actually make them into posters and hang them in your room. And uh, we're still working on this. So um, a couple of new ideas is these adversarial examples. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over it. Maybe we'll talk about it more later. Um, so this actually came from, this was a surprising result. A couple of years ago it came out and everybody was like shocked and you know, what's going on, is everything a lie? 
So here's the idea. You take a picture of an elephant. Now you know all the gradients, etc. So you, you pick another category like koala bear. And starting from the picture of the elephant, you try to make it look like more, you try to make the koala neuron more excited. Okay? You do pixel gradients. Um, and you add or subtract to pixels in the elephant image to make the koala neuron more excited. And when you do that, people probably initially, initially imagined that, uh, you know, you, the elephant would slowly morph into a koala, grow some, you know, cute ears, etc. But that's not what happened. What happened is the image went from this to that, which you can't tell the difference with your eyes. And over here, you know, the network is 99% sure it's an elephant. And in the second image, it's 99% sure it's a koala. Okay? And the difference in pixels is that. If you actually magnify the difference in pixels, you don't see any koalas. Okay? So this basically uh, brought a lot of suspicion. People are like, oh no, you know, the, we don't know how these things work. And if this machine thinks this thing is a koala, um, can we really trust it, you know, doing a self-driving car? Um, you know, maybe you'll see a pedestrian and they'll think it's a, you know, garbage bag or something. Um, so the, uh, the discussion around this result is still ongoing. But obviously, these networks respond to something different from what we respond to. Because uh, you know, human vision would never see this as a wall, right? And then uh, you can actually search for deep dream. People actually went to a lot of lengths um, optimizing uh, these regularizations, trying to generate um, realistic-looking images, and. Uh, you know, by taking some neuron and trying to increase its activation starting from a natural image, you can get these uh, very nice looking pictures with um, surreal images. Um, and you get <laughs> these nice looking uh, figures like the admiral dog, the pig snail, camel bird, dogfish. Um, there's another neuron being maximized and lower level neuron. and. Uh, so um, we ran out of time, but uh, all of the references are in the slides, so you can research uh, more along these lines if you'd like to. OK, we'll, uh, we'll continue next week. Hey, Yeah.